today on Touching Lives. Pastor, do you really believe that, that a person can live all, live all their life for the devil? They can live all their, of their life, never go to church, never, never practice any type of religion, never have any kind of spirituality, never have any interest in the Bible, never give Jesus a second thought, and then 10 minutes before they die, do you really believe that people can call on Jesus and really mean it, and Jesus will save them, and He'll wipe the slate clean, and He will take them to be with Him? And I said, well, I know one that did. With hope and encouragement for life, this is Touching Lives with James Merritt. We're beginning a series this morning called On the Fringe, and I just want to kind of give you a little warning about this series. I hope you won't miss one time of it. I hope you won't miss one message, but I just want to give you a fair warning. I've got a feeling that for many of you in this room this morning, and many that will be watching by television, this series may touch your heart more than any other series you've ever heard or ever will hear. Because it will touch a lot of raw nerves. For many of you, it will bring up a lot of bad memories. It will trigger a lot of painful recollections. Because the truth be told, at one time or another, we've all been an outsider. We, we, you know, we've all been on the outside looking in, and yet the way that Jesus deals with these outsiders, with the outcasts of society, should both encourage those of us who either have been there or think we're still there, and enable those of us who aren't there to start looking at those who are, are there maybe a different way. We look at an encounter that Jesus had with one of these people on the fringe, because it's fascinating to me that the last earthly encounter that Jesus ever had with another human being was not with the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. It was not with the king of a country. It was not with the president of a nation. It was not with even a respected religious leader. His last encounter on this earth was with an absolute, complete, total, unequivocal failure. This man had failed in life. He was about to fail in death. And yet, because of what happened when he met Jesus, we learned one of the greatest lessons we'll ever learn on how to deal with failure. This is what I'd like for you to write down. This is what I want you to take out the door this morning. You can have failure in your life without being a failure with your life. You can have failure in your life without being a failure with your life. If you brought a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to the third gospel. There's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I want you to turn to the gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter. And we're going to look today at a man that was a complete failure. And the amazing thing is, this man finds redemption after all of his failures. This man finds redemption in the most unusual place, in the most unusual way, at the most unusual time. Of all the places this man finally gets it right, he gets it right at a cross. Luke 23, and we're looking in verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Now, it's interesting that Jesus was crucified between two criminals. Let me tell you why. Normally, People were crucified in groups compared to the kind of crime that they committed. And what that centurion should have done that day was crucify the two criminals by themselves and crucify Jesus by himself because he was guilty of a totally different crime. As a matter of fact, nobody had been crucified for what he was accused of. He should have been crucified by himself. What that centurion didn't realize was the reason why he put Jesus between those two thieves is because he had to. Because Isaiah had prophesied 750 years earlier that the Messiah would be numbered with the transgressors. He would be crucified with sinners. This is the only crucifixion in the history of the world that was ever predicted to happen exactly the way it happened. And what makes it even more unusual is you've got these three men being crucified for a crime, but there's one big difference. Two men are being crucified for a crime they did commit. One man is being crucified for sin he didn't commit. But therein lies a great word for those of us here this morning. No matter how badly you have failed in the past or no matter how great a failure you may think you are right now, I want you to write down two or three things. Number one, Jesus will take us under any condition. Jesus will take us under any condition. Now, I have to be honest with you, and I, you know, I'm not God and don't claim to be, but if I had been God the Father... I would have at least let my son be crucified with white-collar criminals. 
Okay, I mean, at least you know, let him be crucified with somebody you know, dying in a shirt and tie, right? I mean, somebody that just maybe embezzled some money or took some money out of the cash box. No, he's crucified with what Luke calls criminals, and that's kind of a, or a, you may have it in your version, a thief, which is kind of a cleaned up version. What that word literally means, it's the Greek word that literally means evildoer. Matthew and Mark use a different term that literally means violent robbers. In other words, these were not just petty thieves. These were not, these were not pickpockets. These guys had a rap sheet a mile long. They were bad to the bone. I mean, they were really bad. Most likely they were paid assassins. They were guilty, no doubt, of multiple murders in the first degree. If they were alive today, they would have been a part of a street gang, the kind of a street gang that you can't even join until you murder somebody. So about anything you can imagine they did, they did it. They murdered they raped, they stole, didn't matter any crime you could think of committing, they committed it. And you could have written their biography in one word, fail. As a matter of fact, they were such losers and such failures, they were so inconsequential and so unimportant that we still don't even know their names. We're never even told who they are. They had failed at doing anything right. They have succeeded at doing everything wrong. So it looks like these two guys have just wasted their time and wasted their breath. They've lived a wasted life. They're about to die a wasted death. And then something radically changes. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He says, Wait a minute. You're getting what you don't deserve. We're getting what we do deserve. And to me, it may be the greatest story of a conversion in the entire Bible because the same mouth that had been cursing Jesus and reviling Jesus just a few minutes before is now defending Jesus. And you're probably asking the same question I asked myself when I was going over this message that I, I never thought before. Well, what happened? What in the world could have happened hanging on that cross that would have made that man do a 180 and say, wait a minute, you're not a criminal like me. You are the Christ. You're not a sinner like me. You're the Savior. There's something different about you. And I'm thinking, what happened? He didn't, Jesus, he didn't see Jesus perform a miracle. He didn't hear Jesus preach a sermon. What in the world happened to that thief to make him change his mind? And according to Luke, the only thing that this thief had heard Jesus say up to this point, verse 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And somehow when Jesus said that, and that thief sees this man respond to people who are crucifying him and condemning him and cursing him, all of a sudden, like lightning going from one end of the sky to the other, this truth flashes before he eyes. He says, hey, I get it. Jesus, you don't deserve to die, but I do. I'm a sinner, but you're the Savior. I'm a criminal, but you're the Christ. Forgiveness, that's what I need. And I just wonder, I just wonder, Jesus, if what you just offered the crowd would you offer to me? And I, I've just got a, my feeling, probably with not a lot of confidence, with fear and trembling, probably couldn't even look Jesus in the eye. Probably while he's staring at the ground, he kind of mumbles just real softly this simple request, verse 42, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't say, Lord, I want to be honored when you come into your kingdom. Lord, I want to be blessed when you come into your kingdom. Lord, I want to be rewarded when you come into your kingdom. He just says, Lord, since everybody else has forgotten me, would you just remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus, would you remember me? Would you, Jesus, give me what I deserve the least but what I need the most? Jesus, would you give me forgiveness, and would you just give me a place in your kingdom? Now, most of us know the story, so we already know what happened, right? We know the answer. You may be here and you say, I've never heard this story in my life. Well, if you know anything about Jesus, you can figure it out. I mean, you know Jesus wouldn't say, no, you lose, <laughs> right? I mean, we, you, you say, well, no, I, I'm sure that, you know, he did because and here's what I want you to understand. This man needed what Jesus had to offer, but he couldn't offer Jesus anything that Jesus either needed or wanted. 
This guy had no leverage. He had no bargaining chips. Couldn't make a deal. You know, I've heard people say so many times, I've heard people tell me, you know, they get sick and they get cancer or they get this or they get that. And they'll come and you know, Pastor, I got this and I got that. And I told God, God, if you'll heal me, I'll go back to church. God, if you'll heal me, I'll do this. God, if you know, we've all kind of, you know, we've all kind of made a deal with God. Well, how's this guy going to deal with Jesus? And what's he going to say? Now, now, Jesus, if you'll remember me, when you come into your kingdom, I'll go to church. Well, you ain't going nowhere. Uh, Jesus, if you'll remember me, uh, when you come into your kingdom, I'll be a better husband. I'll be a better dad. I won't cheat on my income. I'll tell you what, I'll start tithing if you'll just remember me. No, he realized that Jesus had something he needed that he was offering. He had nothing to offer Jesus. And I want you to hear this. If you're out there right now listening to me, and, and you're that failure, and, and you're the one that's blown it, and you're the one that you feel like, well, there's no way, God, you don't even know the skeletons in my closet, Pastor. You don't know how bad I've messed my life up. There's no way God would ever accept me. I want you, if you don't hear anything else I hear, I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. What you're about to see in this story is, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. There is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. Because watch what happens. Not only do we learn that Jesus will take us under any condition, we also learn we can trust Jesus at any moment. We can trust Jesus. Now listen again to what this criminal says, verse 42. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's kind of interesting. Matthew and Mark do not record this conversation. We would have never known about this conversation if Luke had not included it. He's the only one that records it. And I'm glad he did because what you're witnessing here is the only deathbed conversion in all the Bible. You know, I've had people say to me, Pastor, do you really believe that, that a person can live all, live all their life for the devil? They can live all their, of their life, never go to church, never, never practice any type of religion, never have any kind of spirituality, never have any interest in the Bible, never give Jesus a second thought, and then 10 minutes before they die, do you really believe that people can call on Jesus and really mean it, and Jesus will save them, and He'll wipe the slate clean, and He will take them to be with Him? And I said, well, I know one that did. I know one guy that did. Because, you know, he, he's in the Bible. And, by, and listen, you won't find anybody in the Bible in a more desperate situation. Think about this thief. Here he is, brutally crucified, dying in agony for crimes he committed. He's a guilty man, justly condemned, justly punished, getting what he deserves. He knows death that just is a, just a little while away. There's not going to be a stay of execution. There won't be a last-minute reprieve. The sand in his hour class has a few grains left. He soon is going to be dead. As a matter of fact, he is as close to being dead dead as anybody could be and still be alive. And at the last moment, probably this is my own opinion, I think with his last, last breath, because we're not told he ever said anything else. With his last breath, he makes this one final appeal to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the universe. And I will tell you one more time, it is the most amazing example of faith in all of the Bible. Because here's a man who is just minutes away from slipping off the clothes of earth, putting on the clothes of eternity. And he says, Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus makes a reservation for this man in the kingdom. Now think about this. All this guy said was, remember me. Because all he had to offer was himself. I mean, he couldn't say to Jesus, uh, Jesus, remember my good works. Because he didn't have any. Um, Jesus, remember my church attendance. He never went. Well, Jesus, now you remember all my offerings. He never gave. All he could say was, remember me. Just remember me. We've all been there. It's the cry of the mother who gives birth to that stillborn child. And all she can say is, Lord, help me through this. It's the broken heart of the widow who's lost her spouse of 60 years, and now she's all alone. And all she can say is, Lord, please don't forget me. It's the unending plea of that bedridden person that suffers incredible pain 24 hours a day, and all he can say is, Lord, see me through this. And it's what he said next that's just, this is, what, this is the part that boggles my mind. What boggles my mind is not that he said, remember me. That's not the part that blows me away. The part that blows me away is the second thing that he said. Lord, remember me <clears throat> when you come into your kingdom. What? 
Jesus never looked less like a king in his life. You do understand. Jesus had been beaten to a pulp. His own mother would not have recognized him if she had met him on the street. I get it, Jesus. You're not a criminal. You're not, you're not just even a king. You're the king of kings. And when you come into your kingdom, I want you to remember that. And, and listen, don't, don't miss this. This is big. This man was never baptized. Never took the Lord's Supper. Never went to confession. Never joined a church. Never gave one penny to the Lord's work. Probably robbed a lot of money from the Lord's workers. But never gave a penny to the Lord's work. And what's even worse was, there wasn't one thing this man could do for Jesus, not one. And there wasn't one thing this man could give to Jesus, not one. And the only thing he had left was to accept what Jesus was doing for him. And what does Jesus say? Man, you just got to get happy with this, right? And he said to him, verse 43, Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. This man was out of options. Too late to turn over a new leaf. Too late to pay everyone back. Too late for a new beginning. For this man it was too late. Too late to get married. Too late to have kids. Too late to get a job. Too late to be responsible. Too late to have a decent life. Too late to make amends. Too late to join a church. Too late to get baptized. Too late for everything except come to Jesus. It's never too late to do that. And then this is the last thing. Jesus will transform us in an instant. Now watch this. This is where it really gets good. Jesus says, truly I say to you today, you will be in paradise. If you like to make a note in your Bible or like to write down things in your Bible, you might want to circle that word truly. It's the Greek word amen. You know, we say amen sometime in church. Well, amen is a word that guarantees the truth of what, being, of what, of what is being said is going to happen. And so, think about it. These are the last words that this thief ever heard. This thief dies. And he's got only one thing to base his assurance. He's got only one thing to hang his hope on that the minute he draws his last breath, he's going to be with Jesus in his kingdom. The only thing he has to go on is the word of Jesus. That's all he's got. The only way this thief had of being sure the slate's clean, my failures are gone, I've been forgiven, I'm right with God, I'm going to be a part of the kingdom is because Jesus said so. And I want to say something to every one of us in this room. That's the only way any of us can know we're in the kingdom of God. Is we've got the word of Jesus. Because listen, one of two things is true right now. Right now, that thief is with Jesus in the kingdom. Or Jesus lied. Now, Jesus lied, the thief died, and he didn't make it. And you can't sit there and say, so bad, too sad. Because if the thief didn't make it, you're not going to make it. If the thief didn't make it, I'm not going to make it. Because the only assurance that we have is Jesus never lies. Never has and never will. It still amazes me. That this thief believed, listen, listen to this, he believed and never saw the empty tomb. He believed and never felt that earthquake that tore the veil of the temple in half. He believed and never saw the ascension. He believed, never saw Jesus walk on the water, never saw Jesus feed thousands of people, never saw Jesus turn water into wine, and yet the moment he wrote the word faith over his failure, Jesus forgave him. And Jesus cleansed him. And Jesus gave him a part in his kingdom. So here's what I want to do. We're going to wrap this up now. Let, let, let's just review what happened. You got two, you got three men being crucified, two unrighteous men, one righteous man. You got two righteous men who are rightly suffering, or two unrighteous men who are rightly suffering. You've got one righteous man who is wrongly suffering. You got two criminals who are getting what they deserve. You've got a king who's getting what he doesn't deserve. Jesus gets what he doesn't deserve, the judgment of God, so that he could give that criminal what he did not deserve, the grace of God. And I want you to think about this. This is, I love this part of the story. What a day this turned out to be for that criminal. Because go back, you're, you're the criminal. You wake up, this is your day to be crucified. You wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, this is going to be the worst day of my life. 
I have lived all of my life. I have thrown all my life away. And how's it going to end? I'm going to be nailed to a cross. And what he thought was going to be the worst day of his life turned out to be the best day of his life. He wakes up in the morning in jail. At lunchtime, he's hanging on a cross. And at dinner time, he's in the front row of the VIP section of the kingdom of God sitting next to Jesus. Blue light specials don't get better than that. I, I, they just don't. Now, I, I want to close by asking one last question. Have you ever wondered why all four gospel writers specifically say that Jesus was crucified between two thieves? Have you ever wondered why they only talk about three crosses? I know, and you know, there were a lot more people being crucified that day than three people. Why do they only mention three crosses? And oh, by the way, why do they all specifically want us to know he died in the middle? He died. He didn't die on the right. He didn't die on the left. He died in the center of those two thieves. Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think it was God's way of telling every one of us in this room, everyone watching by television, everyone watching on the internet, everyone that will hear this message five years from now, it was God's way of telling all of us in this room that just like those true criminals, you've got a choice. Because you think about those two guys. They committed the same crimes. They were convicted by the same court. They were condemned by the same judge. They were castigated by the same crowd. Both of them were about the same distance from Jesus. They both had the same opportunity to make the same choice, and yet one of them dies on the wrong side of Jesus, and one of them dies on the right side of Jesus. And it all came down to one thing. It came down to a choice. See, there are a lot of things we don't get to choose, do we? You didn't get to choose where you were born. By God's wonderful grace, I was born in the greatest state in America. By this God's grace of God. You were born somewhere else, you're to be pitied. We were, I was born here. <laughs> but I didn't choose where to be born. You didn't choose what family to be born in. I didn't ask to be born into my family. You didn't choose the IQ you were born with. You didn't choose the looks you were born with. You didn't choose your height. You get to choose your weight. You didn't choose your height. <laughs> I, if, I, if, I, if I got to choose my looks, I'd be Brad Pitt. I didn't get to choose. <laughs> and so when really, if you think about it, when it comes to the life you live on this earth, you didn't get a vote and you didn't get a voice. And you sit there and you say, well, you know, that's really not fair. Wait a minute. God does something better. All the things you didn't get to choose, they're all going to go by the wayside one day anyway. But the most important decision, God says, you know, when it comes to your eternal destiny, when it comes to where you're going to spend forever and ever and ever, you get to choose. It's up to you. I'm going to do everything in my power as God to give you a chance to make the right choice. But in the end, it's up to you. So here's the point. You have failure in your life, but you can choose not to be a failure with this life. Because this criminal had made a lot of bad choices in his life. But let me tell you about this criminal today. He's not spending eternity reaping the fruit of all those bad choices. He's enjoying the fruit of the one good choice that he did make. And in the end, if you want to, if you will make the best choice, which is trusting Jesus, he can wipe out all the bad choices. So you walked in here today, and you're sitting there, and you're saying to yourself, boy, pastor, I wish I could make up for all those failures in my life. You can. Because when you make one good decision for Jesus, you can cancel out all the other bad decisions you ever made. So here's the point. So what's it going to be, guys and gals? What's it going to be? Before death, these two criminals were separated by about 12 feet, but after death, they were separated by eternity. And what separated them was not the degree of their wickedness. It wasn't the magnitude of their failure. What separated them was real simple. One rejected Jesus, one received Jesus. And every one of us is going to die one of two ways. 
You will either die with a clenched fist in the face of God, or you will die with an open hand to the heart of God. You may have failure in your life. You don't have to die a failure with your life. And you can make sure today you are a part of his kingdom. Because if you say, remember me, Jesus says, I will. Are you struggling with the guilt and heartache of past decisions? Does your failure seem so big that you can't see a way out? Don't battle your situation alone. Call Touching Lives at 800-413-1131 today. We want to pray with you. There is hope. Jesus is waiting to turn your failure into forgiveness. We know that failure is inevitable, but it doesn't have to be the last chapter in our lives. The aftermath of making bad choices can leave us full of regret, guilt, even heartache. But Jesus came to help us put failure behind us and to turn things around. Don't let the ghost of failure steal your future. Learn how to move beyond your past mistakes and move toward all that God has planned for you with the series On the Fringe. Order your copy today at touchinglives.org or call 800-413-1131. Jesus didn't come to earth to hang out with those who had it all together. He gravitated to the ones we tend to run away from. Those are the people who need to know how much he cares, how he longs to have a relationship with them. Because of your prayer and financial support, Touching Lives is able to share this message of hope around the world. 